the standard is still the standard. The standard is still the standard. It's December 7th, 2020. Welcome aboard. This is Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 432. Are you sure? I, I hope so. We spent 10 minutes before we went live trying to decide what podcast are, which Dude, is I had lo- so much dy- dyslexia on my last post. I, <laughs> Did you? 342. I was posting it. Yeah. Well, you know, we're not perfect, and that's fine. We don't. I was joking with someone earlier. It's like we actually, which is, this should not come to a surprise to anybody who's listened to our podcast at least more than once. We never edit. We just go live, and then we hit click, and then Micah reviews it, puts, puts up some awesome show notes, and then posts it for all of you to enjoy. And we appreciate, hey, we just appreciate you. As as always, it's Monday, and uh, this is it. Crushing Iron Podcast, episode 342. We appreciate you tuning in. We know you have a lot of options in the podcast universe, especially those triathlon related. And it was a awesome triathlon weekend. We'll get into that here in a little bit, but we appreciate you tuning in. We cover all things triathlon and a whole lot of life. Uh, we'll sometimes dive deep and do the training methods and outlines you should be Hopefully taking on in your swim, bike, and run endeavors. We'll go race recaps. We'll do race previews. Have on the occasional guests. But for the most part, Mike and I, as both coaches and athletes, and definitely not experts or professionals, uh, just give our open, honest opinion on pretty much everything. What we're going through personally with life, with training, what our athletes are going through. Sometimes we'll hop into our Facebook page. You can always search that. It's Crushing Iron Group. Answer one simple question. We'll let you in. There's a wide variety of people, a wide variety of athlete abilities in there, and everyone is open to answering and helping you out with your questions. So feel free to post in there freely. And you'll get a lot of great feedback. We've got uh, beginners and people who have never participated in the sport. We've got Ironman champions, everyone in between. So hop in there, be a part of the wonderful conversation. And that's, speaking of conversations, that's kind of what we do. Mike and I as best friends and uh, partners in crime and just sit back, relax, have an open, honest discussion about our personal life, what we're observing in the triathlon world. We have no sponsors. We have no ads. We have one agenda. And that is to hopefully keep you happy and healthy in your endurance sports training journey. (sighs) That was nice, man. Thank and, you. I uh, thought that was a nice, soft, yet <laughs> targeted soft. intro. <laughs> yeah, happy and healthy. In happy your and healthy in your triathlon endurance training uh, journey. Yeah, but let's just get right to it, man. Blown triathlon away. Triathlon is back. I'm <laughs> freaking blown away. I, I will be yeah. the first. I am always a skeptic when it comes to like new coverage and race formats and whatever. And, and I st- I'll still be honest. I'm still unsure of the viability and longevity that the PTO will have in terms of shelling out this kind of money. Um, although they got some for initial investor and, I, and I'll, we'll go with that. But if you, if you didn't get a chance or you just thought it wasn't going to be good enough and for, you know, and you had that right based on like every other triathlon coverage you've ever seen outside of like ITU level racing, Go back and watch Challenge Daytona that was went live yesterday. Um, I watched it on the TV on Peacock TV. It was free. Um, it was unbelievable. I watched. I turned it on for at, from like nine thirty and didn't get up till the third pro crossed the finish line. Uh, that the men. It was absolutely. Oh wow! I watched the whole thing start to finish. Um, to the big chagrin of, of everyone else in my house, I was just posted up on the couch. I loved every second of it. I was absolutely blown away when I went and registered for like the link to whatever to sign in. And again, like there's a lot of things they have to work through, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to get on too much today, but I was like, I'm not donating. I want to see what they got. And I went back after the race and donated to 50 because I was like, this was worth every bit. Of, yeah. I'm in a post donation mode. It, it was unbelievable. And so do yourself a favor. It was not just outstanding coverage. It was, it was actually, I mean, for triathlon commentating, it was actually pretty solid commentating uh, from knowledgeable people. They brought in some interesting guests, I thought, with Belinda Granger and Rowdy Gaines, who uh, from, as a former swimmer, I'm all, I love me some Rowdy Gaines, watch, listen to him in the Olympics and uh, the U.S. Pro events, but uh, the format was incredible. The level of competition was insane. It had, I think it was, I think it's just great. I know a lot of athletes that I talked to the weekend, like they only know, you only know the, like, that's the thing with age groupers is, is you only know like the pros pros that are famous for Ironman distance racing. And I, I would imagine that a lot of people looked at the start list and just picked out like the people they only know from like Kona and regular races. And you had, you know, some of the names you press are were like, who, who the heck is this? But these were like some of the fastest people on the planet in short course and long course. And the distance was such that even if the, even though it was advertised as a middle distance event, if you think about the layout of the event, the swim was a little bit short, it's fast, it's two loops, wetsuit legal. Then you look at the bike course, not only was it, you know, I think 50 miles, 
It was also the fastest 50 miles they're ever going to do because there were zero turns. There were zero braking. Um, and so they're going to be on, I think some of the bike splits were like an hour and 30. So you, th- you think about an hour and 30 bike split, like that's not a middle distance event. Like that's not long course. Um, and then the run, obviously, again, like no turns, no switchbacks, like just fast, fast racing. It was so fun to watch. It was, I think, also very educational for the for triathletes to think to just go into and watch in terms of how these people develop their speed and move things to longer and how, and what really, I mean, if there was ever debate, bike for show, run for dough. And it was on display again in full effect uh, yesterday in right. both the men's and the women's. It was fun to watch. It was just, it was great to see people swim fast and basically just like jo- jockey for position on the bike because they did go with like, I think a 20 meter draft zone, which made it like, not impossible, but made those athletes that didn't swim well, that were like a minute and a half, two minutes back, they had to work incredibly hard. Because I think you had 40 seconds to pass once you initiated the pass. Yeah, 45. So in order to like bridge a gap of like two to three riders spread out by 20 meters, like you, like Sam Long, who is, uh, is he won here in Chattanooga last year, he averaged 360 watts for the race. Um, like, it's insane. Like, just the level of, of competition. And the women's race was spectacular to watch as well. Like, with Ann Hogg getting a pit. It was, yeah, we'll talk about it more. But it was awesome. And so go back. I think they're going to be airing it live or, or it's available to streaming, all like the pre-race interviews and stuff. And I think what they're trying to do is, is really, really awesome. The only thing I would suggest is I honestly think that they would gain more money as a company, challenge as a company. If you have all of those resources to, uh, to shoot the pro race, I think it would actually be super beneficial to do the same thing for the age group race. Oh, that's because a really good idea. Yeah. I knew, I mean, personally, if you think about how many per, like, people you knew personally racing, like how fun would it be for your family and friends to watch you on live, you know, quote unquote live TV, even if it's like, you know, the slower, a, a slower athlete sorts of back, like we're not professionals, but I think it's all about knowing people and like, hey, I want to do a race where it's like can be covered live. That's it. But other than that, I, ha- I mean, I give it a 10 out of 10. I mean, I really have zero complaints for the day. And I, ha- I was like, this is probably going to suck because every Facebook live broadcast that Ironman has done, you're like, okay, this isn't even worth, worth watching. We've started the same dude for the last 45 minutes. It was awesome. Yeah, no, they did, they did a great job. And that's a really interesting point about the age groupers. I think that there's something about that that uh, has always been involved in Ironman races, the fact that you're out there on the course with the pros and stuff like that. There's just sort of, you know, there's these pointy edge age groupers that you know are really good and i think that there's a really uh interesting potential there i don't know you know how much that broadcast cost i mean was, i'm sure it was pretty intense i mean there's a lot going on there so but even like a you know a kind of pared down version of it or something just to show uh, you know instead of just the finish line maybe there's a few extra cameras out there and you get some like b-listers calling the shots out there or somebody that aspiring announcers type people or something like that, because I think there's something to that. I I'll think nominate it, myself. I think it drags you in. Yeah, we could do it. I would, I would 100% love to be a, <laughs> but I think it would, it would, it's sort of this idea of, uh, you know, we watch professional football or basketball. I mean, these are superstars and things like this. And that's one good thing, obviously about doing these kind of broadcasts, you start some of these pro triathletes become household names in, in your mind. And then, the idea of bringing age groupers into that a little bit more and making them all part of the whole experience, I think it would be great, you know. But in general, as a guy who used to work in TV, I thought that that was phenomenal what they did. I, I mean, was like, it's like this isn't like no commercial breaks. Yeah, it was just it was perfect. I think there was like one time where my TV refreshed and it was within the first like minute, and I was like, here we go. Yeah, I don't know right. if I can handle this. And then it was basically, I would say it was flawless. I would say it was pretty much flawless the entire time. I mean. Listen, there's only so much you can say commentating wise about triathlon. Well, I know, especially I, I when especially when all they're doing is going in a circle. It's not like the t- things are changing, but I, I did. It, flat it, tire gate. You know, it, oh my god, like quit talking so much about it. I wonder if he's got a flat tire, a slow leak in the front. It's the angle. Okay, relax. But no, in terms of like, you know, I think people don't not everyone, but it, pro- professionals are the output of racing. They, the, you know, Ironman challenge, whatever they pay them. Age groupers are the input that we pay them, you know? So when you think about if you really want to highlight the product that is going to pay you and create the most revenue for you, revenue for you, because 
I think some people think this, but most, I would, 90 to 95% of age groupers don't go do races to, to see professionals because you never see them. Like, yeah. you don't ever talk to them. You never get to be around them. They're, like, done before you're even, like, off the bike, and they're off, like, sharing you may see at the finish line. But outside of that, age groupers don't do them to see professionals. They do them because they want to do them. So if you want to, especially if you're an event management company in a business like Challenge where you have a really good stranglehold in, you know, international, especially in Europe with with awesome races and really great experiences and I will say we had six athletes go do it and they had nothing but incredible things to say about it. they said I think registration took a little bit longer than they would have liked like over an hour for some people which is but I think that was obviously for a couple different protocols but it, whatever anyway outside of that this was a huge transition everything was well run outstanding venue great course very well put on you know if you're thinking about trying to compete and I think like somebody posted an article in our Facebook group about like you know and challenge you know uh maybe, you know, challenging Iron Man. Like, they have a very, very, very long way to go in terms of challenging Iron Man in the U.S. because the U.S. has 20-plus North American events to one challenge race. And, and it's at the end. But they have timing, and now they have, if they have this, like, springboard of, like, hey, everybody, sh-. it's it's a it is a favorable time of year because no one else is racing. You're far enough from... Kona to where people could do it and then still do it because it it was we had again like we had six athletes racing and some pretty solid performances I have never seen a non-championship event be here in the U.S. be that loaded it it was absolutely stacked from top to bottom it was the one of the deepest fields that I've ever seen for an age group race looking at the times and knowing people personally and then and just from following them the last few years and to see like some of the you know you, you saw some like age group Ironman champions like not even place in the top two or three in their own age group like it, it was it was that deep of a field and so I think athletes like that I think they because like in terms of like something I feel like they could advertise, they could advertise that, you know, in terms of like, cause I think a lot of us want to race against, you know, the highest level possible, just kind of see where they're at and be challenged in that way. And a lot of that has been, you know, lost. You know, I think with uh, how the formats have gone to in racing, like you don't really know who you're racing and how you're racing. It's because of, it's such a dramatic time trial difference in terms of like where you're going to end up. And I know it wasn't a mass start and challenge, but you know, they've got one race. So it's like, can they turn that into two? And like, how are they going to use this to, you know, benefit them personally? But all in all, like what a great way to, to end the year, you know, in terms of racing, you know, you had Ironman Florida in 70.3 in November. And I know this race is going on internationally and you know, kind of like without a hitch, like nothing else is going on because everyone else has their shit together. But it's like, hey, you know, it was really awesome to see. Uh, I'm happy that athletes got to race and, and they had an awesome experience. So, you know, we'll see. We will see if it's if it's a one off or it's the start of something new. And, well, and, and that's that's remains to be seen. Well, and we we used to talk about this a lot as like, you know, Iron Man obviously has the full brand dominance in this country and 70.3, but we always sort of felt like maybe 70.3, you know, if somebody would kind of just take that range with rev three, we talked about it with rev three. And we're like, man, if instead of focusing on all these different links, just focus in on 70.3 and, and try to own that thing. And I think, I think yesterday was like a, for me, at least I was looking at it as maybe a, uh, an example of how it could work. I mean, they sort of set the tone is there other opportunities? You know, like one of the things that came to my mind was like something instead of like, you know, you had that all inclusive setup, which is the key. Like where right? else can they do that? But can you do that at a place like Muncie, for example? Could, could you make the bike course, you know, uh, I mean, was it two miles around that thing or a little more than two miles around? Uh, could you find a place that you could get loops like that and have the runners on the inside? I don't know. I'm just talking about Indianapolis uh, Motor Speedway. I mean, that was they have a lake in there. too. I mean, like the, uh, that, that's the thing about and I think like while you, you give them a ton of credit, like they for for what happened this year, they lucked out a year and a half, two years ago when they locked in this location, not knowing that COVID was going to happen in 2020. Yeah, but that's how the, things happen. Right, exactly. Like you have to be, and you know, that's the thing. Like you, in a year like this year, you you need to be responsible and do smart things and be, you know, just, you know, overall make sure that, you know, health is of the utmost importance. But, you know, I think what they saw was, you know, a lot of people are retreating. This is maybe our time to advance, you know, in terms of like not being aggressive, but just taking calculated making calculated decisions and trying to put, pull something off so they they got lucky in terms of they had the event but then 
you know, they didn't have to get a ton of like road permits and do things like they basically had like their own like NBA bubble, you know, in a way. So you think in the future, it's like, you know, hey, how can we do this elsewhere? But the other thing is I loved the, I loved the fact that you had an age group race on one day and then other racing the next day and you could still watch the professionals race and do the thing. Like I think that's one of those things. If you're going to get more and more people in the sport, it has to be – it has to – the spectatorship, if that's even a word, has to increase. Like you have to have more opportunities to not just interact with professionals and watch them but like just observe how things go so you can learn and not just be – you know, there to race for yourself and then leave and like not even really get to see anything else. So I think the overall experience is a good thing. I'll be fascinated to see what they do with it next year um, because there's there's going to be more racing next year and things are going to start to trend back more to normal. So, I mean, I, I got, you know, my hat's off to them. I, I was 100% blown away. Um, we already have athletes, you know, clamoring for like, make it up, make it a team race next year, make which is what they want. You know, it's like, you know, you want, you want to have that kind of, you uh, know. Yeah, I was wondering. Because, you know, I didn't know if it was just because the fact where we haven't done any racing or whatever. It's like, man, that really makes me want to race there. But it did look cool. And I think uh, I love what you're saying, though, about the experience. Because as I think about that, I was wondering, it's like, man, what if the pros race Saturday and then you force them all to hang around and watch the <laughs> age groupers? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I because I think the thing is, is... Uh, one of the, the missing links is that idea that really a lot of age groupers kind of respect the pros and are intrigued by them, but they don't really know them and they don't have time. And a lot of it is because there's kind of so many different names and things like that that come out. But I think one of the things is uh, Challenge or Ironman, they, they, they got to make these pros kind of popular. And I, I think that, you know, something like yesterday really sort of goes a long way towards that. But if you did more of that and back to – uh, you know, like the ITU format. I mean, I think when they started that, I, well, I don't know when they started it, but I think what when you talk about making it television friendly and things like that and, you know, having more loops and and the ability to see them coming through, I've always I've always liked that idea. And, I, and that's what I think I liked about yesterday was like, you know, it doesn't, you know, as somebody who rides at an old airport all the time, like we were talking about that yesterday, <laughs> is like that's where we used we're to train. In, baby. I actually loved it. And I, I just think this whole idea of like, you know, scenery and really going out like 70 miles into the country, like out, I just think it's a little bit overrated. I don't mind a few laps. I don't mind several laps. It's sort of like whenever I drive to Wisconsin and, you know, and everybody's, it's a beautiful drive through Kentucky and Illinois is boring. And I was like, I don't really notice. I'm looking at the road for the most <laughs> right. part. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, I, I and feel like. And if you're like riding your bike, you're staring at the pavement. Like, yeah, you know, uh, I mean, for me, like at, at Wisconsin, the race up there, that what makes that is, yeah, it's, it's, it's scenery is nice and everything, but it's the fans out on the course. So I think that if you had a shorter course where it was more accessible to more fans, maybe more loops. If, if you could work that out without crowding and things like that, then, you know, to me, that's the experience, not necessarily, you know, looking out over the lake when you're driving, you know, you're riding like 25 miles, 20 down no, the I mean, they, that, That's the thing about like, if, so for those of you who may not know, like ITU is like the, is world triathlon. It is like the, uh, where people try to compete to get selected for their governing bodies to participate in the Olympics. It's sprint distance and Olympic distance racing only. And it is the fastest athletes on the planet. And you saw some of them compete yesterday. Um, they have their, their WTS like championship series events in major cities, like downtown, like yeah, London. That's so cool, man. At London, Montreal, like Montreal, uh, Melbourne, Hamburg, Germany. Like they have them in these like major cities downtown where they, they it's basically like, uh, you know, um, Formula One. They have these. They they create these events downtown, and everything's blocked off. There's no cars and courts. It's like barricaded. Yes, it's a, it's a couple laps, but it's and that's why that's also what makes it easier to televise, right? Because you're not having to cover right. so longer, and it's fast racing. It's exciting. So, I think I think ultimately, again, it's great for the it's great for the sport in general. Anytime you can get more viewership and people to. Um, you know, get in and be engaged and talk about it and, and maybe show some people, Hey, this is, this is what I do. I don't do it at this level, but this is what I do. You know, cause I think, I think it's an opportunity to educate and show people, you know, what, what the sport, the great sport that we participate in. And it was, I think one of the most fascinating things to watch is like, like, like picking winners from that start list was like, you know, picking like a freaking 
freaking your final four bracket. It was like, yeah, I'll pick so and so, a couple underdogs, and pick here and there. And yeah. but it was it was fascinating to watch. And you know, we alluded to a minute ago. It's like you know, if you can't run, you can't run. You know, it is all it is all. I tell you, like I don't know how many times we have to say it. It's it's all about the run. It's all about the run. Like if you can't run, it doesn't matter because you're going to get run down. Like no matter how fast you bike, as long as you can kind of, as long as you can hang in the swim and you can hang in the bike. If you have a powerhouse run, see you later. You know, and you saw again, like you saw, you know, some of the Uber bikers just fall apart in the first mile of the run. You're like called it see it by like you're not going to be able to smash that much in the bike and then and then be able to hold it and you knew some of the the powerhouse runners were going to you know come through the field and run you, you it's still no matter what level you're at age group or, or professional if you can't run you have no shot you know right i thought it was unbelievable it was poetry in motion to watch Ann hogg come out of the the two minute penalty she got which you could tell she was super bitter about it um you know, and she was like, that's the first penalty I've ever got in my career. Um, where she came out of the, the oh, pit. really? Yeah, ever. Uh, I mean, I would be too. But she, the, the, the fact of the matter is she still would have lost because she still wasn't, she still wouldn't have caught Paula Finley. But it, she was poetry in motion running, like the most efficient run form. You've like, It's it's unbelievable. And just well, to Paula see. Paula was too, though. Yeah, Paula was too. She she looked at, as, as. We saw that. Remember we were talking about, well, mm-hmm. they were talking about it too, but like. No, we saw that. <laughs> no emotion, no smooth. It was all smooth, no bouncing around. It was just like I'm doing it. But we didn't realize what's uh, what's the uh, the girl who got on uh, was with her on the bike, and then it got hurt. Uh, it was Morrison, maybe. No, uh, it wasn't more. It was uh, anyway. Oh, it was at least Norton. Yeah. Yep. You could kind of see, but in retrospect, obviously, she was probably just trying to. She was trying to be up bike. there. Yeah. And Paula was just like, she was just on a, you know, just. She was just like, go ahead. And I'm here. I thought it was awesome it, just to watch her reaction when she was done. Like, she was running the finishing shoot. She was like, oh my God, I can't believe it. Like, I think it, I think it's very important to show athletes that, or, and for them to see professionals that compete and train at the highest level that have these giant expectations that train an enormous amounts, still have absolutely. No idea who's going to show up on race day. I know and that, it's, it's it, incredible. It's and that was like and that was a thing. Like you you look at the the length of the year and you that's why the thing is like you didn't have a lot of races to like get info on your competitors. Like I wonder what kind of shape they're in. I wonder how they're going to perform today. And she even said it in her in her post race interview. She was like, I, she was like, I didn't think I had it today. I thought that was she, I thought I was over biking, but I just went with it and. I had the perfect day that you never have, but today I had it. And I think that's like one of the hardest things for athletes to understand is like, no matter how you go into a race, you're always going to have moments of self-doubt, but you still, no matter how you're flawless or how even like terrible your, your bleed up has been, you never know like what's going to happen. Like take uh, Tim O'Donnell, who I thought had a still had a great race yesterday he was the second, uh, he placed second place at Kona last year, had a broken foot and couldn't run for like weeks and weeks and weeks. It wasn't even sure if he was going to start in Kona. Ran his way to second, one of the fastest overall times ever. You just don't ever know. And I think it's just, it's important to say, to say that, I think, and for especially age group travelers who take this sport sometimes more seriously than the professionals, is that you just don't know. You don't know who's going to show up on what day. And, and that is also the hardest thing, is that once you have that perfect day, like she, she said she had yesterday, it's like, you're always kind of chasing that perfect day again. But the truth mm-hmm. of it is, is you may never have it. And, but that, that's kind of like the, the allure and the addiction of the sport is like, you might not ever get it back, but it's, it's in the, the, you know, the grittiness of trying to get it back. But yeah, she was like, Hey, I didn't, I thought I was going too hard, but I had it today and there I go, you know? And I think Eden said the same thing on the bike. He was like, I thought I was pushing too hard, but then he said, but I reined it back in and just thought, I'm just going to bike my race. And then he went off and, you know, freaking rained her body down like two seconds. Yeah, that was impressive. Uh, th- I would like to say something about the uh, penalty thing. Um, because I agree, yeah, she finished outside of two minutes or whatever. But I think it's a different race if she's on her tail a little bit more, too. You know, that could have made a difference. You know, because uh, all of suddenly she's coming on. And here's the thing is, like, I, I don't want to complain about it because, like, penalties are definitely a part of the the deal but man there it's just like uh i don't want to say subjective but like you know what i mean like all day you could probably and i don't you don't know if it's she like got warned. it's like holding it like she didn't you're right it is like holding. it's like holding it's like, like they could have called it on it. 20 of the guys in the first five minutes of the bike right like i was like yeah. why are they not calling this it was like blatant and two of the guys that, uh, that were being blatant about it 
but like a Vincent Louis, like he ended up coming in, he would have been like right on Iden's heels because mm-hmm. he sort of two minute penalty. I think he was like two to 14 back, you know? So it's like, you look at those things and yeah, like it's part of it. Like you got to follow the rules, but it is, it's like one of those things that's super subjective in terms of like, do we call it? Do we not call it? Isn't is it you know, a violation of the spirit of the, of the day or the intent? And it, it does, it kind of takes away, but yeah, you never know if, if she would, also, you know, felt her coming behind her or you don't know like would she have come out of the gate and ran like a bat out of hell had she not right you just never know like the one other thing i was thinking about with that especially was that um because the course was completely flat would, would that have made a difference too you know like you talk about the running and if there's a hilly course i think just it's easy i don't say easier but maybe easier to run some people down or you know the opportunity will be more there but on these pros that are just kind of cruising along at their pace it's going to be hard to get much more variance and of course you saw that on the bike too but so i was thinking to myself man was there a way to like maybe make them run up some of those turn banks you know to like throw some hills in Mm -hmm. there in the last couple laps maybe after the bike was over well you saw some of the cyclists take the take the high route i know i flew back in i was like trying to like get trying to like whip back in and like gain some nascar speed i thought it was really interesting uh to watch and it it was like being in the tt position and throwing that kind of power down like you that's why you saw a lot of people especially at the front of the field for the men is like they just they freaking blew up they just they you know they were throttling it in that position with no brakes no turning no sitting up and that's why you saw so many of them just absolute there was just carnage the first like two or three miles and saw the ones that were reserved you know, coming off the bike, you know, 15th plus back, just kind of smooth roll. It's like, it's having that. And I think in age groupers, everyone can have that kind of confidence. It's having that confidence to be like, if I really, do I want to run my best race or do I want to see what my ego can do compared to everyone else's ego today? Mm -hmm. And that's like one of the biggest battles even age groupers have is like, and this is something I told our athletes going into the day. I said, no matter what, your only objective today is to run your best half marathon ever. And that's it. And that's, if that's all you, and it sounds so simple yet so odd in terms of like how you should take on the day, but that's it. Like that is your number one goal as long. And that's another thing is like, that's why it was, it was so gratifying as a coach to watch so many athletes like participate in the event. It's like in a year that's been so trying and so stressful and so ridden with anxiety and and doubt and, and, you know, uneasiness and uncertainty around races. And if this race is even going to happen, you know, it's like to see so many people get a chance to like toe the line and express, you know, their opportunity and, and take their fitness to the bank, you know, cause like this whole year, like you, you've had two different kinds of athletes. You have athletes who it's like, Oh, well you can't go to the bank for eight or nine months. You're like, ah, I'll just quit working then. If I can't go to the bank and make deposits, like what's the, you know, what's, what's the big deal? Why am I going to, why am I going to make this cheddar? Right. And then you have athletes who are like, Oh, well I can't go to the, can't go to the bank for eight or nine months. Dude, I'm going to work freaking overtime and I'm going to start stashing cash underneath my, my mattress. I'm going to put it in my pantry. I'm going to start shoving it behind, you know, the freezer. And when times to come, I'm going to roll up into that bank and I'm going to spend it all. And they went out there and they spent it all. And it was, it was, it was a, it was a great, it was great to see them get out there. We had the, all six of them PR to three, four of them had open half marathon PRs within the day. And it's just, it, it's hard to articulate and sell athletes on, the the fact that the run is so important the run is where you win races because it's the least it's the hardest i think it just because it's it's just hard to run hard after you get done with it but then it's also it's the least sexy you know you, you get to buy the cool gadgets on the bike and you get to ride the cool bike and you get to go fast and you get to pass people and then you get to the run and it's just like ah oh man you know and then you get smoked um as we saw in the professional suit it's the exact same way you know, so it was, it was awesome to watch. And just, again, a friendly reminder to all those out there is, you know, bike for show, run for dough. Mm. Yeah. And as you watch that, it's like, I, I was thinking about it while I was watching. I was like, man, this is so cool. And I, for a couple of times thought about sending my buddies a link, you know, that don't do triathlon. And I'm like, they're going to hate this, you know, because they, I, the bike I could see him maybe getting into, but like the run, it would be like, man, I would just watch somebody run. That isn't exciting. But until you know what it feels like and that you know when you when you see the yesterday they were coming in off the bike and you saw them go through transition you knew exactly what that felt like and I think it's just because we know so well what it does feel like and how hard it is to keep that run alive and and we you know you see pros kind of I mean one of the things I was thinking about was like there a lot of them were in the same boat too I mean the 
the excitement for them to race had to be really high because it's been such a tough year for so many people. Then all of a sudden you have to come in and really try and perform. You know, it had to be a lot, I feel it. I would think there would have been a lot of pressure going into that day for a lot of these people just because of the, the uh, little racing they'd been doing. And then all of a sudden here's all that money on the line and let's go get it. And uh, it, it was just a, you know, a testament that, you know, pros are human too. It's like, you know, we were watching that ride and uh, you could see it. You could see it kind of sinking in on a lot of them. It was like, man, this is getting tough. And even if they've been riding it, it's just like, I mean, to take it to that next level out on the race course and that flat, you know, ride the whole time. You know, we talk about like, I don't know, whenever I ride hilly courses, it's just that break you get sometimes coming downhill. It's just like, is so much, it's that active recovery, right? But there's no recovery in that. And um, it's just, I can't imagine what that must be like to try to maintain 20 meters but also stay right there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? It's like that tension of not dropping and not creep, creeping. I, th I think it was, you know, the two things there is like, I know when they were doing the broadcast, they were talking about Paula Finley, you know, she did all of her training on the trainer. You know, yeah. like you could tell. And that makes sense. She was smooth and she didn't, she didn't move. I thought it was really fascinating to watch all the different professionals bike positions and how much some of them moved and rocked and how smooth some of them were. Like, you know that, and Paul's coached by Paul Souza, who's like one of the, probably not, he's probably in the top one or two best triathlon coaches on the planet that probably no one's ever heard of. Um, and you and I, you knew he had them dialed in to do exactly, and she won the race the previous year, but dialed in specifically for that race, like on the train. Like, yes, it's more fun to ride outside, more fun to change things up, but you don't change things up when you're at that level if you're trying to accomplish one goal, you do what's required. And you could tell she did exactly what is required. And I, I, she is such a great follow to, and someone you should all cheer for. Just in the fact like her story is incredible. Like back from being in the 2012, going for the 2012 Olympics and being like Canadians golden child and then having, and then f flopping, you know, it, it, famously almost in terms of what she ended up last in the Olympics. And, you could see how t obviously you could see how talented she is. It was, it was on full display yesterday, but have having followed her some and watched her kind of rebirth in the sport the last three to four years, and to see somebody who had such a rough mental and emotional toll, you know, kind of put on her from you know a, a country and a governing body, and to see her come into her own and and look happy and be free and expressing her full on fitness, like that's what we all aspire to do, right? As age groupers, like the, we. So many athletes and get into the sport because they've got, they've had rough periods in their life. They've gone through something, you know, traumatic. They they want to sh prove to themselves they aren't this or that. And and I think we forget that you know professionals are people too. You know, and they have these things to overcome. They have these obstacles to overcome. And they have these self doubts. Like they have these things that they they have to deal with. And so to watch somebody like that overcome it after such a long time, it's like the best version of somebody's self. You know eight years later, you know, and doing on the, on a, the world stage at a championship level race. It's, it's just fun to watch. And it's, it's, I think, I think it's a great, again, a great reminder for us all age groupers is like, they're going through the same things. You know, they might have the same responsibilities because it's their profession, but like, they're still people. They still have thoughts. They still have feelings. Oh, yeah. They still have heart rate. It's like, they have to manage all of those things. And to watch her do it, I think was that way was just it was just spectacular and I, I do think going to the, your other comment was like I think that was part of some of the the reason for some of the men especially and even the women to drive the front of the train they just didn't want to worry about it like mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about the, the I don't have to worry about giving the distance if I'm at the front you know I just got to worry about setting the pace you know and making sure that I'm not having to be the one that's always going to be jockeying back and forth or getting past and slowing down because if you got passed by somebody you're not just getting past you're having to drop back 20 meters you know, and if you think about, you know, it was just, it was really, it was a fascinating watch just because the dynamics were what they were. It's trying to be as little drafting as possible. The swim was also awesome to watch. Maybe want to get back in the pool, like to watch how fast and how effortless and just how strong these swimmers are and just how much, if you can't swim, it don't matter. <laughs> like you don't have to be in the front of the pack, but the separation between the front of the pack guys and the back, like you, you have to hang. You know, if you don't hang, then you're you're definitely not going to win. You might be up there, but you're not going to win. You you got to hang, and and because of the swim for the pros, especially in a race like that, it's it's not about winning the race. It's just about 
you know, I was telling one of our athletes, Chuck, I was texting, I was like, it's the swim, it's a swim race to get position for the bike so you can race the run. That's exactly what it is. Like, you don't want to be too far back because to bridge those gaps up to the front, doing 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 meters, going 100 watts over what you're trying to average. Like, those take bites out of you. You know, to get, like, let me say, Lionel Sanders, for instance, like, he was two and a half, three minutes plus coming out the back and he bridges way up. To the front, I think he came in like a minute and a half, something back, like he came in fourth. Um, and you think about the effort that he had to put in to come all the way from like 40th something to like eighth or ninth coming off the bike, the effort to pass those people. If he doesn't have to make that, then you you would, I mean, I think you have to guess that he's running faster, right, without having to put forth that effort. And what, what does that mean for his for his race? So it's just that's that's the, the sport is so difficult because it's so fascinating and so complex because it's not just a sport. It's three sports to create one and you have to, and that's why it's so great as a coach, like, and that your work is never done. You're just always trying to like figure this out. And when you give race plans to athletes, you're like, you know, you hate being like, we have to be conservative here because we hope this is going to get you to your best result performance and it's hard to tell an athlete that's motivated and type a and competitive and wants to do their best and best and best to understand that doing your best on the day doesn't necessarily mean going all out in all three it means getting to a point to where you can allow yourself to get your overall best performance because you were patient and got good enough fit and got in good enough fitness shape to be the best you can be at the end and it it's hard to to get to get that through but once the athletes buy in then it's you know it's a it's a game changer because you can approach things in a much different way. Let me ask you this: We talking about Lionel. He's been from I don't really know a lot about him, but he's been from what I heard is like really been trying to work on his swim, mm-hmm. mostly because he's a great biker yeah. and, like, and a solid runner. And so, like, I didn't really pay attention yesterday, but um, you know, swim to me is like one of the like he could have his swim going good but if, if something happens earlier if he gets out of position or he gets locked back in that back group he's screwed right oh yeah i mean so he's, like he doesn't you don't want to lead a group you think about huh you don't want to lead a group like that's no, the no, thing but like, i mean like as you as a swimmer in his position like what what like what are you thinking about when you're at the start line there i mean are you gonna uh you sprint that's the th- great thing about the professional race and following is like it's it's a totally different race dynamic so i would i would imagine for him that his number one goal was to sprint as hard as he could in the outset to get on to the back, to get on the very back of the second group uh, and just use them as a draft and let them pull him. Um, Because if you don't, then you get separation and then you're in the third pack and then you're probably one of the faster people in the third pack. So now, Mm -hmm. now you have to pull it and do more work to go, to go slower. And if you don't push the pace then they're not going to go with you. So then you fall farther and farther and farther behind. So it is like, you know, and you have to know and the, and the pros know, like they know who's going to be in that group, you know, is, is Sebastian Keen, they going to be in that group is Sam Long going to be in that group, which and is, uh, you know, a couple of like, uh, okay, I'm trying to think of this guy's name. Um, a couple of the guys like that are around that same level of swimmers, and also great bikers, people I can kind of work with to kind of get up my way to the top. Mm-hmm. And but then if you don't, then you're just gonna get you get popped off the back and popped off the back. And it's it's a lonely it could be a lonely swim. That's why I was it was so fun to watch like the massive separation you saw in like this uh, in the difference between the first loop and the second group, just how strung out it got in professionals. You know how know, much difference it was and how different the speeds were. It was just a blast to watch. But it's such a learning opportunity for any level athlete to watch how important every leg is in that you know like there were like and it wasn't even 1.2 miles there were like Ironman champion swimmers getting gapped by five minutes coming out of transition like that's the level of competition it was like like when you I I think we all do this and I think it's there's no fault in it because that's all you follow is Ironman and Kona and those professionals on Instagram or whatever it's like I, that's a whole different, it's almost a whole different sport compared to what you saw yesterday with like these ITU level short course athletes just laying down the hammer in the swim, like, and on the bike. Like it just, it, and it, but it was, it was fascinating to watch like even some of the longer course guys come through and have good showing. Um, it's yeah, it's, it was, it's, it's a, a lot of lessons, been, man. Yeah. You know, it's been fascinating just since I've been in triathlon, which has been about eight years or something just to see like, and maybe I'm just imagining this, but when I started, you know, the idea of doing a half was seemingly, you know, impossible. And then when I finally did it, I was like, wow, okay. 
you know, it's still long course racing, but I, what, I feel like I'm, I'm watching it just shrink into this. I feel like a half is turning, is getting closer and closer to that short, you know, like you're saying, like these guys are out there just blasting these things now. And, and the times are, are, of course, that wasn't a half exactly, but you know what I'm saying? It's like that sort of distance and the idea of just kind of going after the whole thing. I mean, you're talking about, I mean, where were they? They were running 530s? Eden was running 515s. 515 uh, after all that. And it's just amazing to me to see how that race or that distance is kind of like coming back towards, you know. And, of course, it was a short course race. They were finished in three hours. That's not a long long course race. Like for some of the guys that are out there, like their, their best days ever on Ironman are sub eight. That's that's way less than half the time they spend. Like it was not, it was advertised as a middle distance race, but the way the format was and how the little how it was shorter on all three legs, but then just the fact there were no turns, no braking. It was it was the, the setup of all setups in terms of speed, and it was it was it was like it was three hours of pain. You know, like zone three, zone four for them. Like how fast can I go without blowing up? Yeah. And then also knowing who you were. You know, that day. That's what those were the things that that. Iden said when he won was he was like you know I thought I was uh, was pushing it a little bit too much on the bike and then you know I decided I was going to rein it back and, and and stay it was like I need to stay something it was like I need to stay within my my goals for the day or, yeah. you know, or, and he huh. did and he was like he had confidence I mean he's I would guess most people have never heard of him but he won the 70.3 world championships last year in Nice on a road bike uh, fairly unknown and he should be you know uh, ever you know forever known now in terms of you know his level I think he's like 23 24 it's like just it's just mind-blowing to see athletes of that caliber um and he wore his lucky hat which I thought was super cool he found it on like a street in Taiwan he said and it's just he now he wears it for every race and he has like he says just good luck but it, it was it, it's they're on a totally different planet in terms of but they still are human they still you saw with especially with the professional men you saw people make mistakes you saw people over bike you saw people have to pay for it on the run with pacing and you know i think it's it's obviously a different animal when you talk about the prize money that they had for the day like it was are you racing for the paycheck or racing you know are you going to risk it to make you know a half mil you know versus trying to do your best in the day i'm sure that was you know for some of them you know who need to put food on the table because travelers don't get paid you know that much if anything outside of sponsorships this year it's like hey i I gotta do that or it's like i just want to see the best i have today because and again, like professionals have more opportunity and, and have more, you know, again, yeah, opportunities, I guess, to go back and look at their race results. But for age group athletes to go out and perform, like you want to know if what you're doing is working. And if you don't go out and execute, then you throw a major wrench and muddy the water in your past training to actually see if it's worked because the result you got wasn't because wasn't something you could base on your performance and training. It was something you should base off of because of poor decision making. Mm. And if you have poor decision making, then it doesn't matter what your fitness is like because you're going to make stupid decisions, put yourself in a really bad spot every single time you race. So you're never truly going to know how much better you're getting. And it takes a whole lot of patience and a whole lot of restraint for athletes to reach that level. Yeah. The one thing I do want to know is if, what kind of difference? What kind of difference that race is if if there are hills, if there's elevation, on each lap, or you know what I mean? Like, like, does that make a big difference? You think? As because you're talking about just kind of basically holding a pace, you know, like you're saying, it's a riding a trainer, just kind of sticking up in a pocket, and that's a different game for me. Like, if every race, if you, if you had to go up to the top of that ramp on each end or whatever would that like what i don't know i'm just very curious is like what you know does that open it up for different race athletes yeah i mean i don't know about those that small of a difference but that's like that's been like when you hear people talk about putting iron man on like a rotating basis for the world championships that's that's the gripe you hear is well if you're an athlete that just for for whatever reason doesn't do well in heat then it doesn't matter and is it really a world championship you know, if it's, if you only, you know, like for bigger athletes, like they can't perform well there. Like that was the one that that's been always one of the biggest knocks on Brownlee's why they didn't 
do well in Rio because it was so effing hot, you know, but you put them on a cold course, you know, they're from the UK, like they'll absolutely smash you. Right. So mm. I, I do think like there's, there's, there's definitely an argument there. I mean, we say all the time, like different horses are different courses. You know, what if the swim was non-wetsuit legal and it was in choppy water? Yeah. You're going to see a huge difference in just the whole total results of the day. Right. If it was, you know, a hilly bike course with lots of turns, are you going to see, you know, I mean, that's, I think for a guy like Lionel Sanders, who does most of his, is training on a trainer who's not the greatest bike handler you would put if you'd put a lot of turns a lot of turns and uphills and downhills and sharp corners on that maybe he doesn't make it up as much time same goes for like some of the runners like maybe if it wasn't as flat and as fast and in his own and they just slow up and start up but do they have that in them every race that's the thing every race is different for a reason you know and like what if what if the race yesterday would have been normal florida temp and been like in the 85, 90s and dew point high, and he, but it was like perfect race conditions. Like, right. that's the thing. You just never know. You can't always second guess it. But yeah, that, I think everyone does different on different races for different reasons. And I think that's that's part of what being a smart athlete is, is picking and choose for age groupers especially, is picking and, and choosing those races to the best of your ability and kind of canceling out the noise that might be the hype or the popular fun race to go to. If you're really trying to like pick out your best overall performance that suits you the best, then you have to be able to think through things like that. And I'm sure there would have been, there could have been, you know, two or three different scenarios yesterday that could have changed and it would have created a much different outcome. Yeah. But that makes, you know, you race the day that you're given and that's, you know, you do the best you can given that and then, you know, leave the rest and move on. Yeah. Cause that one woman chooses us in her big, big ring, just kind of mashing the whole day. Mashing it the whole day. Yeah. And rolling down. Yeah. And then I think she like started walking at like mile two or three or like he's (laughs) a, yeah, it was a, it was, it was it was really interesting to watch too like the the positions on the bike that the pros had how different they all were like oh, I know you wouldn't even look at Paula Finley's and be like that's not really that arrow compared to like what you would consider at least looking from the side as arrow but it was arrow for her and it was it was the perfect combo of arrow enough and powerful enough so I can run fast enough and that's ultimately the name of the game is like if you if you you can be super aero, but if you get off the bike and your lower back's hurting or your calves are overstrained and your seat was too high and you've been in that position for all day long and you can't hold it, it doesn't matter how aero it is because you're going to lose every minute of that on the run. Like that's just, that's again, like another complexity of the, of the sport that you probably sign up or get interested in triathlon thinking it's like, ah, oh, I just got to swim and bike and run. And then you're like, oh, wait, that's not really. That's so true. That's though, not, dude. it's everything. I feel like I run better on hilly bike courses because I'm up a little yeah, bit more. Everything is is connected, and it's it's about it's about that time, and it's about calculating and judging. You know, like is this position worth it? Is this these few extra watts worth it? Is wearing a wetsuit worth it? Like, there's just so many things to think through that that. But that's also a reason why it can feel like such a lonely and isolating sport is because there's so many decisions you have to make. And if you have to make them all alone, then a lot of times you just kind of guess or you make a decision. You don't have very much confidence that you're making the right decision. Right. And so you, you know, you, you look up on the internet, the fastest way to this and you have like 17,000 different answers and you're like, which one of these is right? You know, it's just all super confusing. So that's why it's great to always have, you know, a person or a coach that you can go to and be like, Hey, is this, is this for real? Or what's the best route for this? Cause a lot of stuff is like, it's common sense. You just wouldn't, um, you just wouldn't believe it, you know, right? but a lot of times it is like the most common sense, simplistic approach to things of overthinking it um, is usually always, you know, always go back to is the simplest, most common sense answer is probably the right one, you know, versus overcomplicating it or having to make a thousand dollar purchase to think you make, might get faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, this conversation is also reminding me that we are, one of our coaches, Jessica Jacobs is a former pro Ironman champion and I recently interviewed her. If you go to our Crushing Iron YouTube page, you can find that interview. So it's on becoming a pro or something like that. She kind of walks through what it was like going from an amateur into the pro ranks and, and how much uh, that changed her training and, and, and how much pressure that can put on you as a pro. And, and since we're talking about it, I just thought I'd throw that out there because she's also available for coaching if you're interested. And... Uh, you can check her out at the website as well, but it's it's just a good interview, and I'm I'm going to be interviewing her uh, again on part two, of how her regiment and training has changed since she's become an amateur again, and now that she's a coach and how she's looking at that stuff. But 
it's pretty cool. I, I, I think it's just fascinating that the pro life and and I would love to see uh, more attention. I've always wanted you know sort of more attention and focus on the pros somehow, and um, I think they deserve it. And I would love to see more and more of them kind of you know make a really good living and just I think I think that's the way to kind of make the sport more popular too. If we can just and allow them to stick bridge around. that age group pro connection and 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 have because the age groupers you know obviously you know we we just I said it earlier but you know so many don't even even I and I'm I'm immersed in this sport every day and I I didn't recognize ninety percent of those names yesterday. How did we change that? Education, man. Education and entertainment. And more stuff like yesterday. Yeah, exactly. More stuff like yesterday. So hopefully, like again, if you haven't if you haven't watched it, go back watch it. If you did watch it, watch it again. And if you didn't donate, donate. Like you know, like that costs. Don't. That's triathletes are so famous for that. Like ah, you know, I'll drop eight thousand dollars on my bike, and then you walk in the local tri shop and like, hey. Uh, can I get a discount? I'm the local uh, tri club. I'm like, dude, I'm a small business. I need to make provide things. Like, can you just spend ten thousand dollars on a bike and four hundred dollars on a helmet? You're gonna wear like three times this year. No, you don't need a ten percent discount because you're part of like the local tri guy, you know, club. Like, that's all businesses go out, like go broke. You know, just don't be that person. Donate and make your. You know, if you're gonna give them a compliment, at least compliment them with you know a little bit of cash money because that's how they're gonna keep growing. Um, as always, we appreciate you. Tune again for our Challenge Daytona recap. Uh, <laughs> for more info on all the things that we do, you can cruise over on our website, c26triathlon.com. It is our one-stop shop for all things coaching, camps, and community. And you have about 20, what, 21, 22 days left to sign up for our club membership for 2021. It is a program where you basically give us your race schedule for the year, and we plan it for you. Uh, next year is going to be quite difficult, I think, for a lot of athletes to manage not just their time, but the placement of races and their level of importance and how to peak and build for those races and uh, make sure you're at your peak for the ones that matter the most. So we'll do that for you. We'll take the stress out of it so you don't have to deal with it. And Mike will be handling that program as I create the training for it. So if you have any questions about that, you can email him, crushingiron at gmail.com. And if you're interested in that program, again, that's c26triathlon.com. Hit on the coaching tab, scroll down three, hit on club membership. We would love to have you. I will be your club administrator. Club club administrator <laughs> extraordinaire. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or comments for me, you know where to find me. C26coach at gmail.com. And I'm crushingiron at gmail.com. And that is it for today. I appreciate it, buddy. It's Always. been a pleasure. See you in five minutes. Bye. Bye. Bye.